and reaching out and blessing the other uh, disciples, ladies who are following after Christ in our city. And one of the things I really enjoy doing here in, in this pulpit is not only inviting you to be about an event, men, to help our ladies invite others, but also letting you know on the other end of the spectrum of how after we invite people and they belong here and they believe here and they're baptized here all under the power of Jesus Christ, after they're volunteers and being trained, we want to send them out. And talking about sending, let me share with you these pictures if you bring that next one up. Uh, here is our team headed off to Panama City. <clears throat> Wonderful crew. Uh, we've got the Quins there, the Heralds, Jamie Sweeney, the Hawkins. In this next picture, we're aware that Panama City is a massively expansive modern city, but not too far outside of this just people who visit there say it looks like Manhattan a hundred years ago. Sky cranes everywhere. But with a little bit of travel, you find yourself, well, next picture in a dugout canoe. And here are the heralds. Some of these villages can only be reached by dugout. In that earlier shot, you saw a hut, a meeting hall of the Embera village people. And in this next picture, you see Teresa Hawkins there with the tribal chief. There with the express goal of sharing Jesus Christ. Here's Jamie Sweeney, not just sharing the gospel, but sharing life. In this next picture, uh, a brother coming up, his sister baptized last week. There is Raul Alvarado, our missionary there in Panama City, consistently making these trips into the jungle. And now here's Chris Quinn <coughs> getting to experience the joy, actually the picture before this, baptizing someone into Jesus Christ. This next picture, here is another indigenous population, Debbie Quinn here teaching English, teaching the gospel with Betty Alvarado to the Kuna people. This next picture, Rosa being baptized. And then finally back in the city, Mike Hawkins preaching as Raul Jr. translates. We knew about this trip. One of the great challenges we have as a church is we can't keep up with the mission trips going out from this place. Found out through Facebook. Here's the Utila mission team. Did not even know that they had gone. Here's a study going underway. What I love about this next picture is a man who is known for working harder than any other behind the scenes with his hands also has the ability to share the gospel and talk about Jesus Christ. And there's Hugh Cooper. They got back in at 1 a.m. this morning. Walk in this morning at 7 o'clock, there's you, ready to roll again. Uh, in this next picture, just some of the physical things they did. A school building in need of a porch. Next picture, Dan Smith, David Stacy, Hugh Cooper, there's the porch. Next picture, and there's the kids. I could go on and on showing you these pictures. Give all these folks a hand for what they're doing. And though, and, and you begin to see, if you're a guest here today, you're going, wait, wait, wait. I, I thought next week was sowing for eternity. I'm not familiar with this church, but you said next week is the week you're going to talk about missions. It is a very special Sunday where we talk about missions, but because of sowing for eternity and because of what Christ has put on this church's heart, it is something we do not every Sunday, but every day. Amen. And so we get to see an opportunity of those that are doing this. Today, as I want to drop off all the hay, all of God's word for you, we understand that the Holy Spirit is not only crucial in the revelation of God through this book, but it is also crucial not just in the revelation, but in the illumination. It is the Spirit that puts it down, and it is the Spirit that gives the unction of the speaker and the preacher to bring that word. Let's go to our Father in prayer this morning. Father, I'm mindful that in 2 Peter 3 and 16, the apostle Peter, who walked with you in the flesh for three years of ministry, said some of these things that Paul wrote down are hard to understand. Father, if Peter can say that, then who are we thinking that without your spirit that we can make heads or tails of this? And Father, today... This broken vessel due to sin and due to illness stands before your children 
And Father, I pray this morning that you give 30 minutes of your spirit's fire and power to get the job more than done. Father, would you illumine what you have already revealed in your word and make it come to pass in us. It is in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Be turning to the book of Colossians, if you will. Appreciate so much Will Spoon. Last week, at a moment's notice, moving his PM sermon to the AM, and then Jamie Simmons filling in and doing a PM assembly. Uh, it's not my style to miss on a Sunday morning, but I tell you what, the flu this year is no joke. And so I appreciate uh, men who can step in and fill the gap. Let me, if you've got that handout on the back as a sermon outline, and before I get into some fresh uh, impartation of God's word this morning, let's review from two weeks ago uh, where we were in the book of Colossians. Our point two weeks ago on a Sunday was this. My compartments need to be completely his. If I want to be a follower of Christ in full, then I cannot have aspects of my life that lay outside of his sovereignty and his plans for me. We talked about two weeks ago how the church in Colossae had bought into this early form of Gnosticism. And they had come up with this elaborate scheme of God is holy, holy, holy. And that's an amen. And the flesh is always evil, evil, evil. And never the two shall meet. And so you have this system of stratospheres of other lesser gods even, if you will, heavenly realms, separating a holy God from all things that are real and flesh and evil is what they thought. And so you see Paul arguing against this in this letter to the Colossian church. No longer say, uh, don't touch, don't taste, don't feel. He goes, no, 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 we're done with that. This holy God came in a physical body and died a physical death. And this holy God made the world and sustains the world. And though he is holy, he is fully engaged with this world. What they had come up with in their elaborate scheme of separating God from reality and the tangible was a form of materialism that though we got started from a different place, we still encounter in full today. Where there is a God, if you will, of Sunday morning, and then I got my Friday nights. There is a God that I praise with spring water from this well on Sunday mornings. But then there's that ref that doesn't call my son or daughter's games the way I think they should go on Tuesday afternoons. And that's a different deal. And so we have a God that is not sovereign over all of my life. And remember weeks ago we talked about how the word all is used 30 times. It's the most prominent word in the letter to the Colossian church. For him to be God at all, he must be God of all. And so two weeks ago, I, I scattered this stage with chairs, with thrones. And we talked about how God must be Lord of all to be Lord at all. And so we begin to conclude that that's all the letter of Colossians is about. But it is far more than just about being a good steward of transferring my things under his kingship. Now the real spiritual person gets ahead of me here and that's a good direction to go. And say, no, 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 no. The letter of Colossians is not just about transferring my things under his rule. It's about transferring my sin under his salvation. Now that is good news. But let me tell you something this morning, church. It is even more than that. We are not talking about just transferring thrones that I am in charge of under his throne. We are not just talking about transferring my sin under his salvation. We are talking about the transformation. Not just transferring, but the transformation of my insides, of him doing something in my heart where he begins to change who I am at my core, 
we are not just talking about him taking care of my past and me trying real hard to practice in my future and following after him, though that be a component of being a disciple. The good news of the gospel, which some of you have never heard before, is Christ has the power not just to change my practice, but to change my preference, but to change what I desire, but to change at my core who I am. There are people in the world today, let me get a little bit of a soapbox away from my notes for a second, who say, well, this is just the way I am. And I guess if I wanted to, I could practice real hard to be a different way. The gospel says that though you can practice to be a different way, that if you walk with Christ, he will not only change your outsides, but he will change your insides. He will change your preference. Uh, someone says, I just have fallen out of love with my spouse. And I guess I could practice real hard to fall back in love with them. Amen. There is something to be said for that. There's a lot to be said for that. But there is also something to be said for walking with Christ and not under your own power just changing your practice, but walking with Christ in the power of the Spirit, which is a confirmed reality through the Bible's teaching and through experience of those who have followed after him, that the Spirit begins to change your preference. We could bring up again and again, and we should, testimonies of those who said, I had gone this way, back to that, uh, of not loving my spouse as I should, not loving my spouse at all, not having a heart for my kids. But this promise of the Spirit coming and fathers' hearts being returned to their families and their kids, it's not just about me being better, it's about God and what he's doing in my life. Now, I want you to hear me right now. There, there is the possibility that what I just said, it, it, you heard it, but you didn't hear it. And so I want you to hear the rest of this sermon because what I'm talking about is God and the Spirit having real power to make a real difference in your life in a real way where it does not relegate you from practicing and participating. That will be clear in Scripture in a moment. But it also does not just lean on that of you of your own accord. So number two, the point I want to get to today, one of the two points, is my character needs to be completely his. It is not just about bringing my things underneath him in a way where I transfer my sovereignty to his sovereignty. And you've seen Christians do this. I want to do everything the way Christ would have me do them. But yet there's no spirit of joy. There's no spirit of love. There are Christians doing Christian things. But brother, if that's the way that Christ operated, there's not that much appealing about that. Where is the abundant life that goes with that? And so talking about making my character completely his, let's read Colossians chapter 3 beginning in verse 1. Since then, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on this earth. For you have died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Let me pause for just a moment to make quick commentary on what we just read. Your life, because of Christ, is hidden with Christ in God. You do not fight for victory. You fight from victory. That's the gospel. Well, I really thought I was trying to get grace, that I was trying to do this or that. You already are. Now bring your life into accordance. You don't fight for victory. You fight from it. He has done this. He, gets, he talks about that victory. Reading on. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. 
Therefore, put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, put to death lust, evil desires, greed, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. Now notice the, notice the, the cooperation here. You have put off the old self. You have put on the new self. Which you are renewing? No, that's not the language here. Which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Or in the image of its creator. Samantha Perkins, hardcore Aggie, down in College Station. These people almost exceed Sooners and their lack of love for a certain team that resides in Austin. Aggies don't have much patience for anyone who wear burnt orange or do this action at any you know, form or fashion. Samantha Perkins and her husband, child on the way, go to have that sonogram done. She was even a member of the fighting Aggie band to see what the gender of their child would be. Without Photoshop at all, here's how that sonogram looked. My, my pulpit's in the way. There we go. Now, for an Aggie, what you don't want to see in a sonogram is your child giving the big hook of horns. This caused a great bit of consternation in this Aggie family. The expectation would be that if you are being born into a family, the blood that flows through you, you would be more of the image of that family that you are in. The passage we just read. You are being renewed in knowledge after the image of your creator. You are being formed into Christ. Romans, Paul uses this language of born and being birthed and born again. In Colossians, it is this language of being raised anew. Because you have his blood, because you have his image, because you are being changed in the womb and the family of God, the passage continues. Here, because of this, there is not Greek and Jew. We don't struggle with racism around here. Circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called, in one body and be thankful let the word of christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to god now let me pick out the word there that as we are being born into his image is our practice and our preference and our walk with god and our decisions to follow hard after him are working in cooperation with the Spirit to bring us into this new life called discipleship in Christ. Let me share with you the words that we just read that show up over and over again. Have compassionate hearts. May the peace of Christ rule your hearts. May He be the one that you have thankfulness in your hearts for. May God rule your hearts. May you set your hearts in heaven. What is the scripture saying here? What is God saying here? It is not just about changing your outsides and your actions. It is about changing the insides in your heart. One of the great things that Ed Mosier put me on to. Ed, where are you? I saw you in here this morning. When I went to, as a student to Abilene Christian University, 
followed Ed's lead out there. Ed said, now Mitch, when you get to ACU out there in West Texas, there is a barbecue place. Where, what was the name of it, Ed? Toby's. When I got there, Toby had passed and his son had taken over and the name of it was? Harold's. Harold's, when Ed first sent me to Harold's Barbecue, I thought he was trying to get rid of me. The wrong side of town and the wrong place in the wrong side of town, the sign out front of this red cinder block flat roof building had more gunshots in it than anything else. But I tell you one thing, and you know this about barbecue, those are the places you want to go. So we rolled, I rolled into Harold's Barbecue. He had a hot water cornbread there that I'm convinced was the manna that fell from heaven. It was spectacular. He had, oh, I, I could go on and on. The outsides of the place, though, were completely, you, you had to run to your car because of the danger you sensed all around the building. But the food inside was fantastic. And the other thing about Harold's that was great is once he got everybody served, and once the line got down to a level that was manageable, Harold would come out every lunch hour, and he'd begin to do this. Go ahead and put up that. You find this on you, this Harold on YouTube today. Everybody say yay. Clap your hands. Jeff, that's good. I don't think he's as good as Booker, but it's pretty good. <laughs> the thing you loved about Harold's wasn't the outside. It was the inside. It was things on the inside were different. That's what God's talking about. How is he changing your insides? How are you submitting to the power of your spirit and yet practicing unto that end? To begin to act, to begin to walk in a way that gives testimony to what he's doing on the inside. Let me, number three, say this this morning. Not only does my, do my compartments and not only do my, does my character need to be completely his, but number three, my claim needs to be completely his. My preaching, my claims about the gospel need to be completely his claims. Paul clearly states in the book of Colossians, this is the gospel. Get ready for this, church. You ask most Christians today what the gospel is, and they'll struggle to give it back to you. They may get hung up on what the response to the gospel is. And Paul here clearly says, this is the gospel. This is his claim. This is my claim. And notice that Paul does this in a time where he's not in a vacuum. There are other people in culture saying, this is where your hope should be. This is where the good news really is. This is where the gospel really is. You say, well, that was back then. How about today? We live in a world today that says your hope, the world's hope, the good news should be found in other things. Here's an example from a, a business commercial I saw just a couple of days ago. We have got a problem. A few problems, actually. We're overproducing. Overcrowding. And overheating. We've got aging roadways. Aging power grids. Aging everything. You're kind of bumming me out, Clive Owen. No, no, wait. Gets worse. We also have the age-old problem of bias in the workplace. Really? Never heard of it. Seriously, it's all over I've news. heard of it. Ah. The question is, who's going to fix all of this? An actor? Probably not. But you know who can solve it? business. That's right. The best run businesses can make the world run better because solving big problems is what business does best. And doing good is just good business. Sorry. So let's grow more food with less water and make healthcare more healthy. It's okay. I'll play the doctor. What do we got here? Let's take on the wage gap, the opportunity gap, the achievement gap. Together we can tackle every elephant in the room and save the rhino while we're at it. Because whatever the problem, business can help. And I know who can help them do it. 
It's a great example of an evangelist. That is someone who is claiming to enlighten and show the way and share the good news. He has a belief of this is the good news, this is what can help, this is what can in tongue-in-cheek save the rhino as well, this is what can help people get along better, this can develop, uh, business can do things that eliminate scarcity and feed all people. When I first saw that, I was a little bit indignant. I'm not indignant. I got over that. If you believe that's what the gospel is, then you should be sharing that. We as a people believe in another gospel, and we should be sharing it. We should be sharing what makes the real difference. We should be evangelists. What do we claim in word and deed is the real difference maker in our lives? Do we claim, do we live out that it's our, our, our businesses, our schedules, our sports teams, or are we living in a way where we claim it is none other than the gospel of Jesus Christ? Here's what Paul says. Here is his claim, Colossians 1 and 21. And you, once being alienated from God, and enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel. What he has just stated. This is not a, not some, not another. This is the hope. This is the good news. By way of review real quick, what was that? You were alienated. You were enemies because of your evil behavior. But now... You tried real hard and you got better, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy and blameless, free from accusation. Well, I'm glad that was an event that I got to step into once and never once again experience. Continuing, if you continue in your faith, established and firm and not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is John 15 stuff. If you remain in me and I remain in you, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. The big thing I want to leave you with today are the first two words of Colossians 1 and 21 when it talks about the gospel. Many of our translations today don't fully get it. In the original language, it gets it right on the head. And you. The gospel will never be the gospel. All throughout the Colossian letter is this plural language. And then Paul says, and you. So many times, and Fred who was evil, and Susie who was alienated, and Sally, who was an enemy, until you get it that it was and you, that the physical body of Christ was given in death for your life so God could reconcile you to him and you. When you get that component, it is then that you become, as Paul is, a servant of the gospel. Today, how can you be one that begins... As Paul would say, I struggle with all of his power. It's this beautiful mix of our choosing to lean into him that works so mightily in us. How will you give him your character today? How will you give him your compartments today? And how will today you begin to make the claim that is the gospel of Christ? Today, if we can pray for you, today, if you will come, Will you come now as we stand and as we sing?